In uh, medieval times, there used to be a warning given to uh, anybody in the business of travel as they entered uh, unexplored or uncharted territory. It was printed on all of those early maps. Hixunt draconis, here be dragons. Uh, the decision, the unexpected decision of the British public to exit the European Union this summer has uh, presented for both parties and, of course, the UK travel industry, seriously uncharted territory. And some months on from the shock result, there's still very little clarity as to exactly how the UK is intending to reach its chosen destination. But there is about to be complete clarity, I guarantee it, for the UK travel industry. To introduce our session, and please don't forget to ask your questions, would you please welcome WTM Senior Executive Kate Macbeth. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to World Travel Market London 2016. My name is Kate Macbeth, and I'm the Portfolio Head of Marketing on the global products that World Travel Market offers around the world. It's great to see so many of you here for this next session, where, as Robert's mentioned, we're discussing the impact of Brexit on the travel industry. Since the vote on July 21st, we've seen sterling plunge in comparison with other major global currencies including the US dollar and the euro, which of course has been great for the inbound industry, but not so good for the outbound tourism market. WTM London's own research has discovered that UK holidaymakers are worried about the potential impact of their holiday costs increasing. Three out of 10 said that Brexit would result in a direct increase in their holiday costs. The industry also fears a staffing crisis alongside damage to the UK's reputation as a tourism destination. The triggering of Article 50 signalling the UK's two-year exit countdown will not take place until next year. The travel and the tourism industry have to wait and see what the impact of untangling EU directives will have on regulation, including the Tour Operators Margin Scheme, the Package Travel Directive, and even if UK travellers are entitled to European health cards. To help give us some clarity amongst all of this uncertainty, we have a panel of industry-leading experts. Before I hand over to Euronews presenter Seamus Kearney, who will moderate the session for us this afternoon, I'd like to thank Gidsby East, Michael East and Francesca Ozog for organising this most important session. I'd now like to invite Seamus to the stage to introduce the panellists. Seamus. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to this debate, the impact of Brexit on the UK travel market. It's no surprise, perhaps, last week that Collins Dictionary actually chose the word Brexit as their word of the year. Uh, and and apparently it's because not since Watergate has a word, a new political term, had such an impact on our language. It's true there has been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, lots of arguments. And are we now going to have certainty in the months to come, or could this drag on for six months, one year, two years? No one really knows. And most of you will be aware that last week the High Court here in London ruled that a parliamentary vote must now be used before the Brexit process begins, the breaking away from the European Union. So what does that mean? And of course, there is a lot of uncertainty in the market. We're going to be discussing the issues with some of the uh, leading industry representatives from Thomas Cook, for example, Cox and Kings, the Monarch Group, and also Jack Travel. But first of all, let's set the scene. There's nothing like having some concrete facts and figures and research. I'd like to invite Caroline Bremner from Euromonitor to come to the stage to help us set the scene and give us a little bit of food for thought before we discuss these issues. Well, thank you, Seamus, for that introduction. I think uh, I have to have a bit of a disclaimer before we continue. Uh, we're dealing with a highly uncertain economic environment and um, what we are doing at Euromonitor is running uh, forecast scenarios. So I'm not promising uh, absolute clarity, but I can uh, show you what the economics are saying 
in terms of uh, forecast modeling. And of course, happy to discuss methodology afterwards. So, first of all, when we look at the impact of uh, travel, um, we've got uh, various different scenarios on the horizon. So we have the fact that a disorderly Brexit, that's otherwise known as a hard Brexit, could reduce the UK GDP by potentially uh, 2%. So that would in then, then entail uh, unemployment to rise, inflation rates to rise, and we're already seeing the price of imports rising as well. And that will not also have a knock-on effect on various other sectors of the industry. But there are lots of uh, other threats out there, as we know. Uh, tomorrow, the US goes to the polls, and uh, a US um, or Trump uh, presidency would actually have a knock-on effect on the UK economy, but not actually as much as Brexit. So there are some uh, silver linings out there. When you look at some of the other major threats uh, across that impact the travel industry, the biggest one, um, apart from things like a Eurozone crisis or a China hard landing, the biggest threat to UK economic performance is a global crisis, such as we saw in 2008 and 2009, where we saw UK GDP contract by over 6%. So in the scheme of things, Brexit is a shock, but it's not the worst thing that could happen. So what does this mean in terms of UK inbound performance? Well, here we are looking at the forecast uh, baseline for the UK. And um, we were actually, we're on track, uh, all things considered, to reach that Visit Britain target of 40 million visitors by 2020. However, if the UK government proceeds with a hard Brexit, that means after two years, the UK does not have set agreements in place with Europe. Our position in the EU, uh, European skies, open skies isn't clear. We don't know how we feature in the US uh, transatlantic deal with the EU as well. And we resort to WTO agreements, then there is a potential that the short-term uplift that we're seeing, you know, record inbound visitor numbers to the UK in August, that could be a short-term lived uh, benefit of the pound, which we've seen drop to a 30-year low by 20%. But in the scheme of things, if we want to have those rose-tinted glasses, Seamus mentioned the High Court ruling, there could potentially be a no Brexit. And that ultimately may be the best outcome for the UK. We vote to leave, but we continue to have access to the open market, to the open skies. And at the same time, we've been seen our, our, our destination become more value for money thanks to the fall in the sterling. So it really does depend um, what lens you're looking through. Are you looking at the UK as a destination, so inbound and domestic? It really is a golden opportunity. As I said, value for money. The UK is now 15, 20% cheaper for international visitors. We've all got friends abroad saying, I'm coming to London or Edinburgh because basically it's so much cheaper these days. Um, equally, on the outbound market side, because of the, the depreciation of the pound, that means that UK consumers have less money um, in the household and to travel abroad, it's going to be much more difficult in terms of costs uh, in the destination, in resort. And equally, we may see that it may take longer uh, with a hard Brexit for people to save for that uh, well-deserved break. Now, what happened in the last crisis was that uh, value for money products such as package holidays, all-inclusive, cruise, all these were very attractive cons to consumers and it allowed them to save and they knew what the costs were up front. And I'm sure we'll be discussing more about that with these experts uh, in the panel that's coming up. So who are we dependent on in terms of the UK as a destination? Well, here we're looking at UK inbound receipts by our key source markets. We're very dependent on the US. Now, at the moment, we are in a good position because the, the dollar is strong and the pound is weak. However, if there were to be a Trump presidency, we will see a similar shock happening to the US. 
the dollar will start to weaken, the markets will be spooked, um, and you know, we're likely to see a similar sort of shock response. So it really does depend what happens in many different places around the world. But one thing is very certain, that Europe continues to remain a key source of demand for the UK. And we have to ensure that we protect our traditional markets, France, Germany, Spain, Ireland. Equally, there are opportunities. We know that Theresa May is off in India seeking a bilateral trade, trade deal. Great potential to grow the Indian market and huge potential to grow that very fast growing Chinese outbound market. Currently, the UK welcomes uh, 2007, no, to, yeah, al almost quarter of a million people from China to the UK, and they spend uh, half a million pounds, half a billion pounds. We, we need to increase that. And the new deals set up with the UK government to expand flights from 40 a week to 100 is a step in the right direction. So what should Brand UK do? Definitely, we have a golden opportunity to reposition this country as a value for money. The vast majority of tourists that come to the UK spend a lot of money on lodging, which they seem as, which is quite you know, is a good quality lodging. But there's definitely opportunity to grow the market for in-destination spending. Now, with the move to mobile travel sales, um, already uh, we know that mobile is just so dynamic. It's growing at a very, very fast pace. And it also boosts spending in destination, which is brilliant and very sustainable for that country or the local communities. So there's opportunity to grow in destination at attractions, activities, and of course, food and shopping. Now on the right there, we have some of the latest spending figures on luxury. And we can see that some of the key source markets have sort of uh, some fallen in terms of uh, luxury spending like Russia, China, and the US. Now with the, the pound being so attractive for international visitors, London and, and the likes of Glasgow and Edinburgh and Newcastle, everywhere, all these great cities have the opportunity to attract international spending shoppers. So what does Brexit mean from the other side? So we already know that the UK uh, travelers, we, the UK family loves to travel and to take their summer holidays. We're the third largest source of outbound demand globally, after the US, Germany, then it's the UK, and ultimately China's going to overtake all of us. But for now, the UK is a very important source market, particularly to Spain, with 15 million Brits visiting Spain a year. In Ireland, we account for over 50% of their inbound arrivals. You know, there's going to be countries across the world that will see potentially in a hard Brexit, a decline or, or slower demand from UK visitors. So it's about making sure that you encourage those visitors. And again, the proposition is right, particularly for those who's, uh, where, they're, where they're kind of um, feeling the pinch, if you like, of uh, less money in their pockets. So we know from previous crises around the world that when a currency depreciated, depreciates, it does hit outbound demand. And of course, we saw that in Poland, in Brazil, in Japan, in Iceland. And we have to expect that the UK residents, if we continue to see a weak pound, it is going to really hurt them. And that's going to impact outbound demand. So as we look for clarity, um, we have to uh, look at what we can actually control as an industry and definitely connectivity and ensuring, for example, that the right, uh, we have the optimum route network, we have the optimum capacity. We've seen the recent uh, decision on Heathrow, but Ryanair today, Michael O'Leary calling for three, three runways, not just one at Heathrow, but Gatwick and Stansted as well. We also need to make sure that this value for money proposition is real for international visitors. So already in Scotland, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon is, is talking about reducing air passenger duty tax and ultimately abolishing it. Again, these tourism friendly policies are going to ensure that people continue to come to this country. We need to ensure as well that this value for money is uh, also that the, the sense 
that it's a unique experience that visitors receive in the UK and personalized. So much data is being collected through smartphones, through the Internet of Things, through wearables. Um, you know, by 2020, we expect almost 50% of uh, travel sales to be booked globally online, and a, a large proportion of that is on mobile. So personalizing the experience and just accepting we're a pragmatic bunch, we roll, roll with the punches in the travel industry, but it's going to be a challenging environment, particularly because there is so much uncertainty, and it's up to the travel industry to make sure that we're at the top table sorting out what's happening with open skies, what's happening with the labor market and access to uh, the open market and the freedom of, of people. So I'm going to hand over to the industry experts for, for them to give us all the answers. Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, Caroline just a question before she leaves the stage, because of course many of us will be wondering how reliable are some of these figures and some of these uh, predictions and the forecasting, given the fact that we are in uncharted waters. At a market research company, it's often the job, it's a very difficult job. How do you go about, in this situation, we've never seen this in Europe, what kind of models and what is the research methodology that you arrive at figures like two million visitors, fewer visitors over the next uh, 10 years? Well, I think um, basically at Euromuncher, we've been uh, tracking the industry, travel industry, for over 40 years. And recently, we've built an industry forecast model. So I head up the travel team and have done at Euromuncher for over 14 years. I've been working with our data analysts, a very talented team of economists and data scientists. And uh, combined, that collaboration has helped us develop a model that works off a macroeconomic model. So you saw at the beginning, uh, we were looking at four indicators, GDP, um, inflation, unemployment, interest rates. And then obviously through the work that we've done over the years, understanding how the economy impacts on travel and tourism. And there are many companies such as Oxford Economics and the like that do this type of work. And uh, you know, we're delighted um, to be able to, to move into this area. And, and also the fact that our industry forecast model takes into all the factors that we believe impact travel, for example, terrorism, natural disasters, weather. So we've really thought long and hard about uh, what to put in there in terms of variables. Okay, Caroline, thank you very much. You can take your seat. And we'll now call on our guests to uh, join us on the stage. Chris Mottershead, Managing Director of Thomas Cook, UK and Ireland. Patrick Richards. Uh, the Chief Commercial Officer for Cox and Kings, also the website easygo1.com. Andrew Swaffield, the Chief Executive of the Monarch Group, which of course includes Monarch Airlines. And Terry Williamson, the Chief Executive Officer of Jack Travel. Thank you very much. A warm welcome for our guests. I think it would be useful to just get some initial reaction to that bombshell we had last week from the High Court. Uh, many people didn't see it coming, and it's not resolved because, of course, we know the government disagrees with the ruling. It's going to launch an appeal with the Supreme Court. We're, ha we're having an urgent uh, hearing of the court, all 11 judges, in early December. But in the meantime, business goes on. The travel industry turns over, and it's the question of certainty. So first of all, if we can just get some initial reaction to that High Court ruling. Did we see it coming? And does it change the way we look at things now? Uh, I'll start. Look, I think nobody in business likes uncertainty, Seamus. So, so clear, clearly that's, that's something that we wish to avoid. Um, nevertheless, from, from my point of view, um, fail to plan, plan to fail. Actually having the MPs discussing this issue and, and thoroughly going into it has to be a good thing uh, because it will build our resilience as a country to what is going to come in the future. And uncertainty, if, if, if that mitigates some of the uncertainty, that can be nothing but a good thing. But also this could actually prolong things because if we have new legislation brought to Parliament, for example, we could be talking perhaps two years of debates. Is that good as well? Somebody else want to reply? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> I agree with Patrick that it's broadly a good thing if, if we're seeing a bit more discussion and a bit more thought going into the process. 
However, for me, the overriding sense is one of unpredictability. So this is a journey into the unknown to unpick 43 years of, of integration into the EU by the United Kingdom. And it's not been done before. Nobody's ever left the EU. I think Greenland is the only example that's been cited. And that was uh, uh, obviously a tiny uh, version. So uh, the, as business people, I think we just have to be prepared for unpredictability and start planning for different scenarios. Anybody else would like to give some reaction? I th I, I, my point on that one, uh, you, you asked whether it actually was foreseeable, and I think the answer to that question is yes, it was foreseeable. Uh, because if you looked at the actual vote for the EU referendum, 48% you know, of people wanted to stay, 52 wanted to leave. Um, when it's that close, there's 48% of the population is not very happy with the answer. So they were going to do something about it, and this is what they chose to do. And you could say if the judicial system is set up and understood, which quite frankly it ought to be, then we would have known that was going to happen, wouldn't we? Uh, we would have at least known it was going to be contested. Uh, whether what the answer was going to be, we wouldn't know. But uh, a bit like we don't know the answer to whether we're going to actually leave or not leave. Uh, but uh, so I think it was foreseeable that something like that would happen. Um, is it, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing that's happened, but they're talking about a timetable of you know, the Supreme Court potentially sitting in December and an answer coming from that and it'll be interesting to see which way they are they answer the question Thomas Cook I think from a business point of view you just it's, it's business as normal really because we are we are no clearer on um, on any time frames or any final decisions so you literally have to continue uh, in, in the belief that the best will come from it and I think that's our our approach we're positive about what the outcome will be because as a Whatever the case, there's going to be a lot of people discussing it and a lot of people coming up with agreements. So let's just get some very clear answers here on the impact because we've had a lot of predictions and forecasting leading up to the referendum in June, also in these uh, months following and now with this High Court ruling. A show of hands on who thinks their business has been impacted negatively since the vote for Brexit. Already seen figures falling a negative impact, a show of hands. Monarch. Yeah, the main negative impacts were, uh, for us, were during the campaign itself, we saw people very distracted and unwilling to book. So for about six weeks from the middle of May till the referendum itself, which is clearly a short term impact. And then obviously the devaluation of the pound, um, we are, uh, a European airline so we buy fuel in dollars and we pay for our leases for our aircraft in dollars and we buy most of our ground handling and navigation in euros so it's like a 15 or 20 percent increase in our cost base and, and clearly we're unable to pass that on to consumers easily so uh, although you have some hedging built into your system that that's a, a negative Jack Travel, we hear often that uh, the inbound market is going to be more positive than the outbound market, uh, Brits going overseas. Has that worked out for you? Your, your travel company looks a lot at the inbound market? Uh, yeah, our business is a, is a worldwide, we operate in eight, 85 destination markets and 90 source markets, but we have a significant inbound business which has been around for 40 years in the company and, and we spend 90 million pounds a year in the UK on travel products. Um, so it's quite an important aspect uh, of what we do. Um, I think it's difficult to know the long-term effect of this at the moment. Uh, certainly we have seen a short-term blip, if you like, or blitz of, of interest in people coming to the UK, which is principally around, obviously, the, the fall in value of the pound. Uh, but I genuinely believe that's going to wash itself out over the course of the next six to nine months, because we're going to see the cost increases that have been predicted start to flow through in fuel and utilities and all our services and, and so six to nine months time that will level itself out and so because people will have to put prices up um, uh, so i think that uh, there's a, there's a, this initial demand uh, but i think that's actually going to filter away um, again but it's also coming from different markets you know we are a, it's a big a big big inbound business there's you know 36 million as you saw on the chart up there arrivals predicted to grow to 40 interested in the from the monitor the stats are this prediction of two million, not sure where it's come from, 
be interesting to drill in to find out is that in relation to holidays, is it in relation to business, travel, is it in relation to visiting friends and family? Because if you look at that even this year at 36 million and growing at 4%, holidays, which is really where we're in, is actually down 2%. Whereas all the growth is in visiting friends and family. Now, are all the EU people coming to visit their friends and families before they can't come anymore? I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, and business travel is slightly up. So you need to drill into what's creating that and where the impact is. And also it's about perception, isn't it? Because overseas markets, they look at the UK, they hear about Brexit, they don't have all the information, but they, they have a perception of what's going on. Uh, Cox and Kings, you international company, one of the oldest in the world. What's been the reaction from your uh, subsidiaries and partners overseas? I think overwhelmingly two things affect perception. One is value for money and the other is security. So we've done a lot of thinking this side about whether the warmth of our welcome uh, would, would somehow be eroded. I don't think the facts bear that out. ICM recently carried out a poll where they actually found a 17% uh, positive effect from Brexit on people's perceptions to come to the country. Um, underscore that with the value for money. And then the overwhelming unknown of security, because let's face it, that overrides everything in, 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 in this scenario. And uh, probably that's affected London. The, the negative impact on that has affected London but the rest of the country has actually benefited, which has shown that, that, that inbound business is that 4% increase that you talked about. It, it is, yes. Uh, I, I also think that um, from an inbound perspective, that, that there's a, a lot of other things that go on around um, how operators want to operate programs into the UK, where they want to go. We've seen particular interest in, obviously, more tours around the country as opposed to single city um, uh, destinations. It's also about the supply element you know, there's 10,000 more rooms in London this year than there was last year, uh, 14,000 in the country. Um, so there's more supply um, to, to help with that demand. Um, I'm sure Andrew will come on to it, but you know, for, for the future, the, the biggest single thing I think that we as a country need to, to get across is that we are a country, as, as you hear about it on the news all the time, open for business and want to welcome guests to it and want to look after them, make them feel good. Um, we don't rank too highly on that in a lot of the brand indexes that you see. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, that's what we want to be and that's what we need to be. Uh, and equally, uh, the, the things that Andrew will talk about around the open skies environment needs to maintain itself. Infrastructure needs to be invested in. We, you know, you've seen the announcement about Heathrow. I've always been of the view we should build both runways, Gatwick and Heathrow. Um, and we certainly need to invest in the transport infrastructure around the UK to get people around. We do all those things. And I actually don't really think that Brexit's going to make that much of a difference. Terry, Terry don't, to, to take that point, the growth to 40 million has been a great success story. Yes. And that shows that those perceptions of Britain where the food is bad and the weather is uncertain are, are changing. You, you, know, you, you have James Bond, you have uh, Paul Dark, you have all of these iconic, the BBC, all of these things have changed perceptions. I think Visit Britain have done a fantastic job in changing those, those perceptions. We're going to have to try harder than now in terms of advertising, promotion, and even yourselves, and not just rely on the tourism agencies and the bodies? We, we, we do a lot of work. I mean, there's, there's a lot of unknown also EU funding that go, comes into the UK uh, for inbound businesses. And you know, if we were to exit, I suspect that disappears. Um, and, and, in, and again, in my particular case, the workforce is exceptionally important to us. You know, we are a London-based head office business, 240 people employed in London, but we have an office in Edinburgh, and there's been lots of jokes between, you know, when they were going through a referendum a year ago as to whether they were going to be part of us anymore. Um, and uh, again, we've got a big office in Romania, and then outside of the European Union, we've got offices in Hong Kong, Dubai, Orlando, and Beijing. So. There's a lot of impact, and, you know, and going back to Andrew's point at the very beginning, in, in, when that referendum result first came out, I did get people come and ask me whether their job was okay, and is it, are, are they okay to stay in the country? 60% of my London-based workforce are EU migrants, if you like that phrase. And what do you tell them? I tell them it's perfectly safe, they haven't got to go anywhere. But is that true, though? Well, that's the only answer I can give them. I don't know the answer, do I? Don't but it's forget, one of the things we have to achieve. Don't forget questions from the audience. We have the application Slido where you're able to put forward any questions you want us 
to ask, otherwise I will uh, push ahead. I think we have one question here from uh, Michael Baston from BBC Worldwide. Do we have Michael here? I will read out the question. In this time of uncertainty, what is the role of the media and publishers in helping the travel industry to promote inbound UK tourism to a global audience? So just the, the point that I was making, how do we make this work? Who wants to answer this? Thomas Cook, perhaps? Well, I, uh, it's probably not for me to answer, to be honest, because uh, what I would say is that um, all UK inbound business actually is a positive for the outbound business because the more people that come into Britain, then the less uh, people will want to stay in Britain uh, because it'll drive the cost of the stay, uh, people that stay in the UK. It'll drive those holidays up and uh, they'll see the great value of taking a holiday outside of the UK, uh, which isn't quite answering the question. So I've got to hand over the direct answer to um, the guys that are in support of the UK inbound business. Look, I think, I think first picking up on that point, sometimes the inbound segment and the outbound segment of the business are pitched against each other. What might be good for one is bad for the other and vice versa. Uh, I think that ignores many synergies that we both rely on the same air capacity, uh, we both rely on the same transport links, we both rely, all, all, all of these things are, are, are absolutely crucial. Yeah. So I think we have more in common uh, between us than, 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 than pits us against each other. Uh, as to the question on the press, um, the press want to find a good story. And sometimes those stories involve uh, negativity. And I think there's more to be positive about than there is to be negative about. Uh, my view on that one is the press have a huge responsibility to promote the country in the right way. Um, and I think that uh, it's easy for them, as Patrick alludes to, to find a good story, um, and maybe not be quite so positive. A lot of, a lot of good press is, is negative, not positive, it seems. Uh, and I think there is a, a huge responsibility to ensure that this country is open for business, it is welcoming, we still want people to come here, um, and we're not looking to change that. Because one of, one of, sorry, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think the, the, um, the elements that underpin the, the concerns around Brexit for the travel industry are broadly the same for inbound and outbound. Um, and uh, I, I would agree that we should avoid making false divisions between inbound and outbound. The, um, the reality is that outbound tourism creates huge value to the UK economy, uh, as does inbound. And the two use the same agreements and the same infrastructure. So things like liberalized air travel across Europe, things like visa-free travel in and out of Europe, things like the European health insurance product, uh, things like the ability for people to move freely and work, uh, and also uh, things like legislation and regulation and financial regulation. All of these things matter for inbound and outbound. And we, as an industry, should try to explain them better. And I, I would say to uh, Michael that you could help by educating the politicians and the public through the media about these issues and certainly come and talk to us in the industry to better understand them so that we can inform the route forward through Brexit because it's really going to be about the manner in which we approach all of these things that will determine how successful or otherwise the country will be at the end of it. Because think, one, just, sorry. To add, just to add to that, I think um, one of the things that we have to, the media can help with is actually to mo promote the things that we need to remove. And most definitely, uh, APD, we're definitely all aligned that that has to be removed. We are the most uncompetitive country when it comes to APD. And I think we've got to get behind that and remove uh, passenger duty across the whole country. That will stimulate more travel into the country and also will provide better uh, prices and a better price for people who want to go on holiday outside the country. But perhaps also in this time of Brexit and the fact that nothing has resolved the uncertainty, the media always have that, that in the background. That's one of the, the main themes that they look at. It's always there. Just moving on, one of the key points in this High Court case, those who support uh, the vote going to Parliament, say that it will bring more transparency, that the industry 
and that those who are going to be affected the most will have a chance to be involved with Parliament in the drawing up of the strategies and also helping in the negotiations and putting forward their demands and their ideas. Is that something that you agree with? Absolutely. I think it's, um, it's very important that we engage um, fully, actually, with, with all the, the governmental bodies to help them understand the implications of any decisions that's made which is different to the status quo. Is that happening now, though? Are you it, actually it has already started. You're yes. having a dialogue with uh, the uh, ministers? Absolutely, this is happening. And I think it's, it's essential that we do it. We like the status quo, but potentially that may not be there. So any movement, any change has to be fully understood because the implications can be significant. Because how long can you go on with this question about the immigrant workers, for example? This is another anonymous question here. The tourism sector employs a significant number of immigrants. What is the possible impact of Brexit on travel and the hospitality businesses? We've touched on that, but yeah. how long can we go on without having an answer on that? And you know, the ministers are not providing answers on well, that. Uh, People First estimates that uh, the UK employs something like 24% of its hospitality workers from the EU. And in London, it's 64%. So it's unimaginable that London could train that many non-EU workers to replace that, that volume of people. Uh, and uh, therefore, if we want to have a successful inbound business, we need a successful hospitality uh, sector. And we are clearly going to need to train more local people, but also we need to find a way to continue to bring people in. And the current narrative from government is very much anti that uh, and I think we need to talk about the economic impacts of those changes because whilst we all understand that there is a political I I issue around immigration which none of us are qualified to talk about we can talk about the impact on on our businesses and on and on hospitality and whether or not it's possible to run a hotel in London without European workers we're already just um, talking to Monarch, of course, so includes Monarch Airlines. We heard uh, reports a few weeks ago, EasyJet is actually not going to wait for the government uh, to uh, seek a, a European Union operator's license with an EU country. They're actually going to do that now. They say they can't afford to wait. Is that something that your uh, company would consider doing? The Monarch is quite different to EasyJet. So um, e EasyJet is basically a product of the European Common Aviation Area, which is the open skies single aviation market in Europe, which has allowed airlines to be based anywhere in the EU, and as long as they've got a license in one of those countries, they can fly anywhere in Europe. Monarch has grown up from 48 year, years ago from a, a, a very different place. So our business model is basically built on flying British people to Europe and back again. Now we also fly about 15% of our customers are Europeans flying here, but the EasyJet business model is basically built on the European Common Aviation Area. So they've realized very quickly that they need to have an operating license somewhere in the EU that's not going to be leaving the EU. And, and I predict that you know, you'll see uh, uh, that happening very quickly. Uh, well, we've heard uh, EasyJet already saying it. and, and that's the only way they can ensure themselves against the possibility that we leave the common aviation area. But what I would say on that subject is that we should remember that as consumers we've all benefited from that common aviation area because the net effect on airfares has been to bring them down. Uh, when I was uh, running British Airways leisure sales in the UK and Ireland 16 years ago, we would very often be charging 250 pounds to fly to Paris and 200 pounds to fly to New York. And, and now nobody would pay more than 60 pounds to fly to Paris. You know, so that, that competition that's been created by the liberalization of the European aviation area has brought prices down. And I think it would be a very backward step for this country to go away from that. Now, from a monarch point of view, we're less affected by that because we're basically flying from the UK to Spain and other countries in Europe and back again. But having said that, we, we would have to reapply for those rights as the United Kingdom. We don't currently have those rights. They're, they're created by the EU. 
Equally, we don't have the right to fly to the US without the EU. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. A and the easiest way forward would be to remain a member of that common aviation area. But it probably means accepting the free movement of people and the supremacy of the European Court of Justice, both of which were key arguments by the Leave campaign, uh, which won the day democratically. So uh, we have to acknowledge that we may not stay in that area. And of I course, think, this moves think, on think, to lots uh, of other areas, including protection for travelers, a lot of the European regulations. Yeah, I think maintaining a liberal environment unites us here, all of us here on this, uh, on this panel. Uh, just getting back to the, the labor, the question on, 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 uh, on the labor force, it's not just the quantity of labor, it's also the skill sets. Uh, Caroline uh, outlined a number of the nationalities that we believe that can grow. Uh, C-Trip's own research shows that a Chinese-friendly hotel that caters well will convert 20% better than one that won't. Uh, these things actually foster and generate more tourism. Ditto with the Indian market, ditto with the Korean market and all of those, those global markets that, 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 that can be the future. And, and just take, taking uh, uh, the, the previous point made, I believe that 92% of pret a staff are, 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 are European migrants. And, uh, and frankly, they're the most happy service oriented <laughs> staff you can meet in London. Uh, there has been a report in, in the last few days from the Association of British Travel Agents talking about a surcharge of 10%, up to 10% in light of Brexit. Uh, does that seem like a reasonable claim to be making from the AVTA? I think it, um, it depends on whether you're covered from a foreign exchange point of view. Uh, that's not uh, something that we, uh, Thomas Cook, are considering. Uh, we don't see the, the requirement for doing so. Um, but it, what I think they're trying to emphasize is the potential impact it has on certain companies that, one, haven't covered their uh, foreign currency in advance, but secondly, perhaps don't have long-term arrangements with hoteliers, and so they, they have to deal with the peaks uh, of uh, demand, of over-demand in certain countries, and the impact also of the currency. So I think it's, there's two parts to that as well. And I think someone like Thomas Cook, um, who actually has its planning well in advance as long-term relationships with hoteliers and long-term contracts and uh, fuel covers, is, doesn't have quite the same impact. So that's not something that we'll be looking at. And in terms of hotel bookings, Jack Travel? Surcharges are not something that's really prevalent in our sector and in our industry, but hotel pricing is priced daily effectively. Um, it's real-time live um, in, in, the, in the B2B world, that how we connect hotels out to the travel trade. Um, so it, it, that doesn't really come into play because you're using current day exchange rates to convert prices. Um, and whereas obviously the surcharging environment Chris was talking about is in package holidays where Not there is yet. part of the terms and conditions. So it doesn't apply quite as much. I mean, some of the, I mean there are some things that could benefit. Uh, I mean, one of the things I'd like to see the government really seriously consider, and again, I've voiced this once more once before, is that, you know, but they chose, and, and this is, we are in the EU, it's, it's actually part of EU legislation, we would be allowed to do it. If we wanted to make the UK an even more, a more competitive, and I understand we might not be able to finance it necessarily the way, but with VAT on tourism products in this country is 20%. Um, whereas an awful lot of our competitor, near neighbor countries, it isn't. Um, they use the special rate of 5%. Um, and I think hotels, attractions, others that have V8 on it, the government could look at whether that is something they could introduce. It's, it's part of EU legislation, so we could use it. If we still have to have harmonisation of taxes, we'd still be able to introduce it. Um, so that would be a, a, a real positive for the UK inbound sector. Let's just bring in Caroline. This is a question from Tourism Ireland. Mark Henry. What is Caroline's organization forecasting for UK outbound travel in 2017 and 2018? Does she expect any regions to do better than others in the short term, Caroline? So, I mean, we're still looking at a highly uncertain environment. And, um, you know, even if uh, Article 50 were to be triggered in March, which is still, it's a bit debatable now uh, with the High Court ruling, um, you know, there wouldn't be any formal Brexit for another two years. So over the next, 
in the short term, 2017, 2018, uh, we were predicting with the hard Brexit scenario that there would be a drop of UK outbound by around about 2%. Um, but what you'll see is that, um, and you know, Thomas Cook and uh, everybody working with the outbound market, you'll continue to see popular destinations that are secure, such as um, Spain, Portugal, Croatia, um, you know, that offer value for money to the UK uh, visitor. Um, they'll continue to be popular, but what, what we'll see is that you might see a change in the booking habits, so maybe going for shorter packages or shorter trips. Um, also the rise of you know, maybe a family breaking the, the holiday up into different parts, so mum and dad go off and kids get you know, sent to the grandparents, so save costs, the rise of solo travel, um, you know, niche uh, areas or linked to hobbies, we might see more of that in terms of, you know, we know that adventure travel is really popular. So again, you know, it depends on the priority of that individual. But in the short term, yeah, we are in the hard Brexit scenario expecting a slight, slight drop uh, in 2017. I hope that answers the question. Uh, one, of, one of the questions that I had following on from that, and we, and we talked about strategies and planning and companies making decisions now. Many people in this room also have to look at their businesses, their travel agents, they're in the industry. They have to look at strategies, they have to talk to banks, insurance companies, and contracts for the future. Do we have the expertise at the moment? Do we have the helplines, that's the word to use, with the government, with the experts, to make sure that we're making the right decisions at the moment? Or are we all really in the dark in these uncharted waters? Well, Thomas I think it is, it is most definitely uh, uncertain. And I don't think if anybody had all the answers today, they'd probably be giving them to <laughs> us. Um, so I, I think you just have to believe in the status quo, um, but be very much aware and have the flexibility to alter. And I think that's something that the travel industry has been um, very, very, uh, well, actually very smart at doing over many, many years. And I think, you know, as a, as a business like Thomas Cook, we have to react. It's not just Brexit. It's not just what the government may, may say or do. There are actually more impactful uh, areas that we have to deal with on a daily basis, whether it's a, a terrorist attack or a, a volcano or you name it. There are always something that this industry has had to deal with over the years and actually has done remarkably well dealing with it. I don't think that this is any different in reality. Uh, I don't see the significance of uh, the implications of Brexit having the same impact as some of the other external events that we've had. I would, I would totally agree with Chris's point. I think we've been living in a state of chaos for the last 15 years, and this is uh, another of those punches that we need to roll with. I, I, my view on that one is I think it's, it, it depends on what the shape of your, your business is and, and the size of it. And, and, and where you generate your revenues and where you send your customers to, because I think, um, you know, if you were making a significant financial commitment for the long term, you just might rethink that. You just might be a bit indecisive. You might not do it. You know, I've generally been the, been of the view that you've got to get on and run your business as the best way you see fit. Carry on and deal with the solutions that, as when you they crystallise and you know what they are more. But ultimately, some people will not make those decisions. Um, so, so that will create a little bit of indecision. Um, but going back, to, you know, to, to concur with what Chris, you know, the, I've been in tourism and travel you know, industry for 30 years. This is a one hell of a resilient industry. We know how to sort these things out. We work it out. And, you know, and whatever challenges are thrown at it, as is Chris alluded to a few of them, but there will be many, many more over those 30 years. And we, we find a way of working these things out. Um, and yes, some some parts of the sector get impacted more than others, uh, but it does move around, and I think it, we, we find the positives out of the negatives, if you like. So, you know, I am still e exceptionally positive about this industry, both outbound and inbound. There will be hiccups along the way, but I'm absolutely certain we'll find a way through them. Just moving on to Caroline, because we saw in a lot of the information, the slides she put up, she used the word disorderly Brexit. How much will that change if you replace the word disorderly with orderly Brexit? How much of this forecasting and predict how much is it going to change? What does it mean? Well, yeah, disorderly <laughs> Brexit is where there's you know, a very acrimonious divorce from the EU. And uh, we then 
nothing set in place after two years. And we then moved to the sort of uh, default uh, agreements with the WTO uh, at the end of the two years. And, and as you alluded to, you know, we don't know whether we have access to the open skies or, or you know, to the US market. So that, for travel and tourism, that is a very, very tough operating environment. And we can see that dealing with the EU, uh, for example, the Canada deal, you know, that was on, on a knife edge and it's been going on for years. So it's not a done deal. Um, I, th I think, yeah, it's, as I say, it's quite uncertain. But uh, an orderly Brexit, actually, we updated our figures once the vote was in and we had the depreciation of the pound. And um, so the baseline figures that we saw on the charts, that's what we feel the status quo is at the moment which means that UK inbound hits the 40 million target. Um, but we also alluded to the fact that we have a scenario if there's no Brexit, where we, we go through the vote process, but then the legal challenge uh, succeeds in clamping it down, and, and we, reserve, you know, we just have a cheaper destination to sell on the inbound side. So people are now reacting to some of the things that you've been saying. Uh, one question here that, that um, takes my interest from One Tree Gift Vouchers, Phil Kellen. Do any of the other members of the panel have an estimate for the increase in their costs in the event of Brexit? And somebody was answering that, weren't they? Monik? Yeah, I mean, I, I gave a, a view on um, the impact of the currency. I mean, it's, uh, and, and Chris mentioned, you know, that many of us hedge our currencies and our fuel and so on. So the impact is an instant. You know, you have a, you always have an insurance against these changes, but they come out in the end. So um, if you have a 15 or 20 percent reduction in the value of the pound, eventually it becomes a 15 or 20 percent reduction either in your profits or an increase in your uh, prices, um, usually a combination of the two. Uh, and uh, that, that will Traditionally, airlines tend to pass on uh, fuel changes about nine to 12 months after they happen because of hedging sort of rolling out. An airline like Monarch is too small to set prices, but you know, you get the big guys uh, out there like you know, the British Airways is and the EasyJets and what have you, and you know, they will be running off their currency hedges in January, February, March, uh, and starting to think about how they're going to recover that. So firm commitments from our other three guests. No price rises, 2017, if wait I until later. If, if I take out business, the, one of the earlier questions about what, what the impact on, on from our business, we generate 50% of our revenues in euros, which generate 20% in US dollars. So it's actually advantageous for the currency position to be where it is right now um, than where it was before. Um, I, yes, I've got some cost based in the EU, in Romania, 250 people employed in Romania. Um, so that would actually be trans so that offsets it. But we've naturally hedged the business, if you like, by actually having resources in other parts of the world that offset the costs um, or the margins that we make on, on the, the bookings that we do. So, um, so I, I generally do not see any cost increases as a well. Is it a position of is is the question around Brexit or is it around where sterling is against the EU and against the euro at the right at this moment in time? And in fact, and, sorry, and, and in fact, we just mixed up slightly these questions. There are two different things. One is the increase in the costs in the event of Brexit, and the one from Explorer, Escocia, uh, from the point of view of a UK inbound tour operator, the price of the tours. So it's these, these two points we're talking about. Well, I think in, in terms of cost is one thing, but it's actually what you're buying is much more important to the consumer. So um, making sure that you deliver the best holiday experience is absolutely a paramount. Um, but what we have seen is, is a movement much more towards all inclusives, and we've contracted more all inclusives. And so in that way, we're, we're catering to what the customer demands. So whether the costs have increased or not, it's what the customer perceives as value for money and how they want to spend their money. They normally traditionally would have a certain budget. That's, that's it. And they will determine where they're going to spend that budget. And actually, if the costs have increased, then they'll take a different style of holiday or a different destination or a different flight duration or a different duration in the, in the, in the time that they take overseas. There's many different variables. It's different times in the year. But they have a fixed budget and that's what they're going to spend. And I, have, I see no reason why that the customers will not travel uh, uh, over and over and again. So and cost it for me is, is, is it's relative. 
uh, but I don't see the implications of that as being significant to deter uh, customers from traveling overseas. We just have a couple of questions already put to us. Deidre Wells from uh, UK Inbound. Is, is Deidre here? Do we have a microphone, please, for Deidre? This was a, a question that came to us. Also, um, our guest from Jack Trevor, also a director of UK Inbound. I am, yes. So, so she's perhaps not gonna the same any, message. So she's not gonna you can answer questions. the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deidre. There's obviously uh, a number of uh, concerns relating to the industry um, since Brexit, be it um, impact on the welcome, on the access to open skies, um, access to single market, and of course the uh, EU employment issue. Um, one of the questions earlier was, you know, how do we get this to government? And I'm in the fortunate or not unfortunate situation of being having a seat at that table at the Tourism Industry Council. Can I ask the panel if you were to give me one? What's your top priority out of that list for us to pass on to government for the negotiations? Well, from, from my perspective, again, I mentioned it earlier, it's the removal of APD because I think it's the single biggest and simplest opportunity to stimulate travel in and out of Britain. Just spell out what that is, just for those who are from overseas and what have you, APD. Uh, it's the air passenger duty that's charged on any customers coming into any airport and going out of any airport in the UK. And the point is that it is not and it's not, a, it's not a fair tax in that it's fair across all the different European countries or across the world. We are 137th out of 138 in the list of costliest uh, or cheapest APD, depending on your perspective. So we are right at the bottom in terms of being the most expensive. And this puts the, uh, the, the, the cost of travel up quite dramatically uh, for, for anybody traveling into or out of our country. Cox and Kings, top of your list at this meeting if that happens? I think maintaining the uh, a, a liberal free labour market is the most important thing especially for a, for a strong inbound business. I'd agree with that, the free movement of labour is absolutely critical to our business. 60% of them are EU migrants as I said earlier. Um, we need the languages, we're not a great nation at learning too many languages. Um, we need it to do the business with all of our overseas based customers. And Caroline, a few heads. Um, for me, it'd be the visa um, regime and just making sure that we don't turn our back on uh, you know, two thirds of our source markets that come from Europe and ensure that they have seamless travel into the country. And because if we start putting up barriers, then they'll start putting barriers up on their side. I, I think uh, for me, the, the, the clarity about whether or not we're going to continue to allow the free movement of people or whether we're going to go the other way and to get that clarity very quickly because it, it almost answers all the other questions. Uh, I would certainly agree with Chris's request on APD uh, but uh, for, for me the whole thing hinges on the free movement of people from a political point of view if we could get clarity that we could live with that within the EU then you can say we can keep liberal air travel, we can keep visa free travel we can allow the things to just keep moving without putting friction in. But if you say no, it's hard to see how any of that works anymore. We'll just take uh, more questions now from the audience. We have about 12 minutes left for the session. If anybody has a, a burning question they would like to ask, uh, we have some microphones floating around. In the meantime, I'd like to um, ask a question of George Close, the editor of Treble GBI. Uh, is he here? You just get the microphone to him. And if anybody else is, is wanting to ask a question from the audience, now's the time to put up your hand, and if I can see you, I'll come to you. George. Hi there, yeah. Uh, the panel talked earlier about the uh, importance of planning for various scenarios um, uh, at this time of uncertainty, and one hypothetical Brexit situation is an independent Scotland. Uh, so I was wondering what might that mean for British tourism, and how could businesses be planning for it now? Who would like to answer that? Well, I, as I said earlier on, we do have an office in Edinburgh uh, with 34 people in it, um, and we operate all of our inbound business to Scotland from that office in Edinburgh. Um, I think it depends exactly what, again, you know, what, is, what does it mean, an independent Scotland? You know, is there borders? Is, are there not borders? Um, 
it's obviously already talking about what Chris and, and Andrew both want. It's actually doing that. It's actually going to halve its APD, I think, uh, or it's going through Parliament at the moment. So that, that, that's, there might be more flights go from these guys going into that country. But uh, it's at the moment we're, we're seeing it very much as, as, as business as usual. It's part of the uh, the, the our overall inbound business, which is split between London, Romania, and and, and Scotland and Edinburgh. Um, we don't see any impacts at all, um, so there's little planning that I can actually put in place for a bunch of scenarios, which I don't even know what the scenarios are right now. Let's get a question from uh, this gentleman here. Uh, my, my name is David Tarsh. I work in public relations uh, for a number of people in the travel industry. It's more an observation, really, um, and response to your question about what the media could do to help, because I'm very taken with the argument that we heard um, from Patrick, from Terry, from Andrew about free movement of labor, and very concerned about what we're hearing about immigration, because it seems to me that it's the xenophobia that's driving the argument and the, the thing of greatest fear. Uh, my suggestion would be that we could ask the media to start the conversation about immigration and free movement of labor uh, by discussing the football industry because I think that the British public when they realize that some of the great managers we've got and football stars would all have to leave that they might rethink the need for the immigrant labor that our industry needs the question though the question anybody want to respond to that briefly we might have a better England team <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's worth it's worth just um, making the point that uh, we have a skills shortage in, in this country, for sure, and we've got a demographic time bomb like most of Europe has, which is, at least Western Europe anyway, which is that our, our population is aging. Uh, so one of the reasons why the British economy has been very successful over the last 20 years is that lots of young people have come to the UK from the eastern parts of Europe, the so-called accession states. Uh, and. Um, that's probably one of the political issues behind the, 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 the politics around immigration, but it, it has enabled the UK to fill those gaps. And if that disappears, we will have a big gap to fill. And there isn't enough youth in the United Kingdom to fill it. So it has to come from somewhere. And it, it is a classic demographic pyramid, which is the wrong way round. Uh, and most people don't talk about that. And I think it's something the media can help educate people on. We have a question from uh, Christian Liebel Cole from the travel company Colette, Vice President of Global. Is he here? Can we get the microphone to him? No. And we also had another question from Joe Dramowska from Celebrity Cruises. Oh. People in the audience? Do we have any other questions from the audience? We have the roving microphones? Or we have our questions from Slido? This is an interesting question, but too far away for me to read it now on the screen here. Um, and we're talking about uh, other core products such as car hire, transport, parking, etc., uh, with an uncertain market. What is the appetite? For those, for those other products, who, who can answer that? I'll, 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 I'll pick that one up. Look, I think, I think uh, there was a question earlier about the, and I'll combine the two answers. There was a question about prices for the tours markets in coming in 2017. And I think it, it, it plays to Terry's point that there are different strands of the way the business works. The uh, presupposition in that question is a, a group uh, fixed tour. Uh, and I think there are some fantastic prices for 2017. Uh, in the more transient FIT markets, as Terry says, prices will be yielded and, and, will, be, and will change by, by the day, so are, are a little less uh, easy to, to predict over time. But overall, coming to this question, I think it, it also plays to, to, to the value and the innovation in the product that, that can be given. And you know, if there is an incentive for businesses to 
invest in technology and invest in good product around the country, uh, we can create some, some really compelling products that people will want to come and sample. And you know, once you, once you have uh, hooked a foreign visitor and you can bring them back to sample more regional tourism, uh, that is good for getting 60% of the tourism into this country comes into London and the South East. And, and, and the aim is to try and disseminate that, that tourism across the country. And having compelling, we, we, we have uh, uh, some fantastic rail products, for example, and that's traditionally be seen, been seen as a, a barrier to getting people out of London and into the rest of the country. So, you know, we think we, we, we really want to invest in developing those kind of products more, which we think will, will bring people into this, uh, into this country. It's not often we have the caliber of guests uh, in front of an audience, like a TV program goes on for an hour and you want to ask your own question. So now's the time. Uh, any burning question from the audience, something we haven't asked? Okay, we're going to have two questions here. Go. Hello, it's Samantha Mailing from Travel GBI. Um, the Discover England Fund is a £40 million fund to develop new products for overseas visitors to come to, the U to England. Is £40 million enough? I would have thought they need a lot more than that. It's a great start. You'd probably all agree. It's a very right? good start, I it's would say. It's a very good start. And it's a very important valuable piece of it, you know, funding that's available if you can access to it. Um, but obviously, we don't rely upon that as a commercial company in order to generate the, uh, the sorts of inbound traffic that we, that we want to do into England. So, um, you know, the, the promotions and the work that we do in the 90 source markets that we operate in is not actually just promoting the UK anyway. We, as I said, we operate in 85 destination markets too, so we are promoting hotel products in all of, the, all of those other markets. We, uh, so, so, one of those uh, tourism products that's getting funding is a seafood uh, uh, program around the southwest of England. Uh, there is magnificent seafood in the, in the southwest of England. Uh, however, it is rather intermittent. It stops somewhere around Padstow. And if I think where I have a house in the southwest of England and go down to my local seaside town, the seaside cafe sells chicken nuggets. Uh, so I think the, 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 the ability to, to develop the UK tourism product and, and, and make that more homogenous and give our, our visitors a great welcome wherever they go uh, is, is, is an extremely important investment and, and uh, 40 million is a good start and better than nothing. And also it raises a question about European funding, uh, development funding, tourism infrastructure and that's uh, one of the big questions people are asking with the negotiations coming up how much money is going to be lost. Uh, we'll take our last question from the gentleman here in front of us. Uh, John O'Sullivan from Tourism Australia. Uh, it's a question for Caroline. Have you done any modelling on a Trump presidency? He said UK would slow down 2% outbound. What's your model show for outbound travel from the US? Good question to end on. We have got a macro model that shows the, the downturn, uh, potential uh, slowdown in the US economy um, if there were to be a Trump presidency on Wednesday. Um, but we've not quite linked it to our, our travel system yet. But um, we can keep in touch and I'll let you know. Uh, but definitely, if, if Trump wins, then yeah, as I mentioned, uh, basically we'll see a similar kind of shock as we had with Brexit and that the currency will, will start to, you know, to fall, uh, the markets will be spooked, and yeah, it's gonna be a similar uh, experience. It's not exactly the same playbook, but as I say, some similarities being played out. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, Brexit wasn't enough, the prospect of uh, a Trump presidency perhaps adding to all of this. Thank you very much to our guests. Uh, a warm round of applause, please, for their insights. Uh, good luck with uh, the months ahead, uh, and don't forget that tourism, it's about people and it's about enjoyment. Thank you very much.